You know, when we think about single photon tomography and positron tomography PET, uh, with single photon tomography, we use radio tracers in the 72 to 140 kV uh, range. With PET, obviously, you know, uh, we use annihilation. It's a positron that annihilates at 511 kV, so it's a very high energy photon. With CT, we use uh, kVs anywhere from 70 to 140 uh, kV. And remember that we're looking at gamma rays here because we can't image alpha particles because alpha particles can be stopped by a piece of paper. We can't Im image beta particles because beta particles are basically electrons and they are stopped by a, by a piece of glass. So gamma rays are the only things that can get through bodies to be able to be imaging. So that's what we do. And we, when we do these different techniques, in both techniques, both CT and nuclear, we generate electromagnetic radiation, which is high energy, which is gamma rays. And we use a certain KV, depending on the radio tracer and how we set our CT scanner. And we have a certain photon flux, how, many, how much photons are coming out to be imaging the patient. And that will depend on several different issues as we go through here. So when we think about nuclear cardiac imaging, we inject a radio, a radio tracer, such as here. It's not the heart. It's the liver in this case. But then we get emissions from, from here, which hit go through a lead collimator to streamline the photons so they're parallel. Then we have a, a crystal, which, it, which identifies the photons hitting. And then it goes through basically a computer array in terms of assessing what this light is that's being scintillation that's caused by the photon. And we get a picture. Now, with radio tracers, we're looking at emissions. And again, we're looking at, usually with the heart, we're using technetium 99M, which is 140 kV. And we're looking at photon flux based on the amount of millicuries we give and the imaging time that we acquire the image. So that will determine our photon flux, and that will create our image, OK? And obviously, what we try to avoid in nuclear imaging is we minimize attenuation of photons, because if we have attenuation of photons, they don't get outside the body to the camera. They just stay in the body and don't get out. So we want to minimize that. And we do that by using high, uh, high energy uh, uh, radio tracers. Now, with CT, it's different, because with CT, we're actually emitting uh, we're, we're generating x-rays that are then being transmitted through the body across the whole anterior part, 180 degrees. And so in CT, we're doing a transmission image, okay? And that's based on a preset KV, a preset photon flux, MA. And the image is actually created by attenuation of photons going through the body until they finally go through the body and hit these detector arrays. So unlike nuclear, where we try to avoid attenuation, with CT, we bank on attenuation. If you don't have attenuation, you don't have an image. OK? So we, if everything goes through the patient 100%, it will all be black. So we base on, we, on CT, we have to have differential attenuation. Now, once, we have our, once we're in the process of attaining these images, we do them over, like I say, over 180 degrees. So, if you think about a single point, we try to do triangulation. So if, a, if, you're, if, you're, if you're over here, and you're over here, and you're over here, in all three different positions, you'll get a different look at something, right? Well, that's the same thing when we use uh, nuclear imaging and CT. We basically, have, we basically have arrays of data coming in all different directions. And where they meet is where we then create an image. OK? So we have all of these rays, and where they become the most abundant, where they meet in all these different intersections, is where an image is created. So that's absolutely pivotal in terms of both nuclear imaging and CT in terms of, of getting an image. So we do filtered back projection. That's what this is. And we use a combination of traditional filtering mechanisms, whether it be the ramp filter or iterative reconstruction. The other thing you have to understand is that when we do filtering, we can filter out anything we want, or we can be as granular as we want, OK? So just take this picture, for instance. This picture is very nice. Now, if you take away all of the high frequencies, which are basically edges and such like that, you finally get to nothing, OK? So it's very important that you pick the right filtering in terms of filtering out such, in terms of what high frequencies you want to eliminate and what high frequencies you want to keep in terms of getting an image that you can identify fine structure and yet not have a lot of granularity to the image. So this is just exactly what a camera does when you look at different 
if you look at different uh, filtering of, uh, of pixels. And that's exactly what we do when we do CT and nuclear as well. So those are some of the basics. Now, what are, I'm going to start with nuclear in terms of what the clinical applications are. Obviously, detection of coronary disease, location and extent, detection of ischemia, risk stratification, and that's been shown very nicely across all different types of patient populations. Evaluation even in the, in the ED, in acute chest pain patients, uh, being able to assess, you know, can they go home or can they not, or they have to stay in. And also in terms of assessing therapeutics and tracking risk, based on changes in perfusion after you give different therapies. One pivotal aspect of nuclear cardiac imaging is stressing somebody, okay? So we have many ways in which we can stress people. We can use exercise treadmill testing or bicycle stress, or we can use pharmacologic vasodilator agents. The three most common are dipritamol, adenosine, and regadenosine. Regadenosine being a new kid on the block, but is being used extensively since it's a selective uh, uh, pharmacologic vasodilator. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And finally, we have dobutamine, which in nuclear cardiology has become almost defunct because of the, of the flexibility of exercise and pharmacologic vasodilators. Now, when we think about trying to identify perfusion abnormalities, it's very important in terms of being able to look at relative coronary flow reserve. So think about flow reserve as money in the bank. And normally at rest, okay, if you have no coronary artery disease, if you then exercise or stress yourself, you can increase flow by about three to four fold. That's, you, if you could not run, I could not give this lecture if it weren't for coronary flow reserve. Because I know when I'm starting to walk around and do things and move around that I'm going to have a higher, I need more oxygenation, I need more cardiac output, and the only way I can do that is increasing blood flow to the heart, okay? What happens when you have coronary disease? When you have coronary disease at rest, in order to maintain resting flow, you use a certain amount of your coronary flow reserve. So if you had, you know, 100% coronary flow reserve, you may use 50% of that just to maintain resting flow. Well, if you're using 50% of it, that means that when you actually do exercise or give a pharmacologic stressor or something like that, you only have 50% left, whereas you had 100% here, okay? So if this is a normal bed and this is an abnormal bed, you'll have twice as much flow here in the normal bed compared to the abnormal bed and that will deal with twice as much radio tracer getting to one area versus the other, and you'll see a perfusion defect. Make sense? Really pretty simple. And I want to emphasize that this whole issue of coronary flow reserve is based on adenosine formation. Because when you start to exercise, you break down ATP into AMP down to adenosine. And adenosine is actually the natural physiologic agent that causes coronary vasodilation when you exercise. So it's a feedback loop. As you use up ATP and all those high energy phosphates, you're, all you're left with is adenosine. And then adenosine is the pharmacologic vasodilator naturally that causes vasodilation. So you can see in this schema that in the normal area, we increase flow dramatically. In the abnormal flow area, we increase flow only minimally. And that disparity in flow is how we're able to see a perfusion abnormality relative to one area to the other, okay? Very important concept to keep in mind. The other thing to keep in mind is that as myocardial blood flow goes up, tracer, as we inject different tracers, and these are all PET tracers, but as you inject different tracers, you also increase flow. So you might envision then, if you have something like O15 water, which is linear to flow, at rest, which is about one uh, milliliter per minute per gram of tissue, you have flow here, and then you increase flow to here so you can see how the difference in flow would be from stress to rest and in an area that might be served by a high-grade stenosis versus a normal area where you would see a 25% change in counts from the abnormally perfused area to the normally perfused area, okay? So that's how you're able to show these differences. And of course, it can be done with other different tracers. This is rubidium showing the same thing. If you can only augment flow to 1.8 in the stenosed area, but 2.4 in the normal area, you'll see a disparity in, in flows, which will result in a disparity of tracer uptake, which will result in a perfusion abnormality, okay? So that's how we do this from a scintigraphic point of view. When we think about radionuclear imaging, and this is also for CT, we also worry about radiation, okay? 
And we know that with technetium tracers, and we usually do a stress and a rest study, we give anywhere from 12 to 16 millicuries of uh, millisieverts of radiation. With dual isotope thallium and technetium, it goes up to almost 30 millisieverts. And so it's very important that when we do imaging that we try to optimize imaging, hardware and software, and use uh, protocols that will limit radiation exposure to patients. So when you think about how we do uh, stress testing, in general, we try to use imaging stress testing protocols where we do a low dose stress and a high dose rest, okay? And if you do that, you can get away with about 11 millisieverts. The reason why here, particularly, uh, and we're trying to promote this more in nuclear cardiology in general, is to do stress first, is because if you do stress first, it allows for what we call stress only imaging. Because if the first set of images are normal, then you don't need to do rest. You can avoid the whole rest dose entirely. And so with stress only imaging in normal patients, you can get down to two and a half millisieverts of radiation exposure. So that's very important, from 11 to 12 to 13 to 14 down to two, okay? And I can tell you, although I'm not gonna have time to show you, with new sophisticated gamma camera technology, we can even get down to one millisievert of radiation exposure with a stress only protocol. So not only does stress only uh, give you low radiation, it also conserves technetium because you don't give the high rest dose. It improves laboratory efficiency, increases patient satisfaction and throughput, and reduces costs by eliminating unnecessary uh, imaging procedures. Several years ago, we actually published data on some uh, 18,000 patients total, of, of which uh, you can see there are 16,000 here who underwent either stress only or rest stress. And we showed there was no difference in outcomes in patients who had normal stress only versus normal stress rest. And this is one of the first publications to show and to demonstrate that you could get away with just doing a stress only study and you wouldn't impact patient outcome. They'd still do very, very well. You didn't need to have the rest image. And of course, the nice thing is you get less than a five millisievert dose in over 60% of patients when you do stress-only imaging. So very, very important. Okay, so what, that's now behind us. Let's look at a typical day in the stress lab. Here we got a guy on the treadmill. And uh, the whole idea here is to push people as much as you can to get, increase myocardial blood flow and to increase flow in normal regions as compared to abnormal regions, as I already said. Exercise is always, always, always the prefer preferred method to induce hyperemia, okay? As long as someone can exercise maximally and doesn't have a contraindication to exercise. People should, it ha should at least achieve 85% of their maximum predicted heart rate based on age. They should get at least five METs, metabolic equivalents of exercise. And if they can do that, then we do exercise. Exercise provides a tremendous amount of other diagnostic and prognostic information. It gives you heart rate, blood pressure, ECG changes, and if the patients have symptoms during exercise, like chest pain, functional capacity, arrhythmia detection, heart rate recovery, which is an important prognostic indicator. And not only that, when you exercise, you get better, you get better imaging because you avoid gut uptake in the liver and in the, and in the, and the bowel. So actually get better SPECT imaging. The only caveat to all of this is that, um, is that you need to always monitor in terms of whether patients are taking anti-ischemic medications. If someone has no prior history of coronary disease, you don't want them on anti-ischemic meds because you can actually, as I'll show you, make an, what would be an abnormal study a normal study. And then you'll say the patient doesn't have coronary disease and you would be wrong. So it, that's one caveat. And the other caveat is PET imaging currently can only be used with pharmacologic agents. Although fluorpyridase is a new PET agent that may be available in the next year or two, which can actually be used with dynamic exercise. It's important to recognize that over 50%, and this keeps growing, patients are not able to perform dynamic exercise. And when you only do submaximal exercise because of a non-cardiac reason, you will not only reduce the size of the perfusion defect, but you also may end up with a normal study because the patient could not exercise maximally, okay? So it's very important that when you choose patients for exercise that you can get them to their maximally predicted heart rate. It's called a symptom-limited stress test, and that's what we want it to be. 
The other thing is that when we think about patients who might be good candidates for pharmacologic stress testing, obviously those who can't do a symptom-limited treadmill test would be one group. The other group would be those with left bundle branch block or pacing rhythms where you can commonly get septal defects on images that are false positives. And just to show you, we did a study many years ago looking at exercise stress in patients with left bundle where almost half of them had false positive results due to left bundle branch block. With pharmacologic agents, adenosine and dobutamine, it's much, much less. So that's why pharmacologic agents are used in patients who have left bundle branch block when you're doing cardiac imaging. This is also true, incidentally, for regadenosin. Uh, and there have been data published. Dr. Thomas and I published this data about two years ago showing also with regadenosin, if you have left bundle, that's the way to go. Now, let's talk a little bit about the physiology of pharmacologic vasodilators. I already told you that naturally you produce adenosine when you exercise and do things, and that's what causes vasodilation. Coronary vasodilation is caused by activation of the A2A adenosine receptor, okay? When you give a drug like adenosine or dipritamol or regadenosine for that matter, you induce A2A receptor activation. And that is what induces vasodilation. So think about it. Since you're using the same adenosine receptor, whether you exercise or whether you do pharmacologic agents, they should be very comparable. And indeed, they are in terms of the results you get. Now, it turns out that when you give adenosine and dipritamol, you also activate uh, other receptors, which you might not want to, because the A3 activation can cause bronchospasm and wheezing. And A2Bs can cause vasodilation and hypotension. And A1 activation can cause uh, a first degree AV block and even complete heart block in some patients, OK? You really want to just activate the A2A. And in fact, selective A2A agonists like regadenosine are now available that selectively stimulate just the A2A receptor, unlike adenosine or dipritamol. So when you think about adenosine and dipritamol, absolute contraindications to using these agents are ongoing wheezing, greater than first degree AV block without a pacemaker, hypotension, recent use of dipritamol in patients who are getting adenosine, because dipritamol will augment the adenosine levels when you give intravenous adenosine. Relative contraindications are remote history of reactive airway disease, severe sinus bradycardia, and caffeine because caffeine also competes for the adenosine receptor. And depending on how much, how much caffeine molecules you have and how much adenosine molecules you have, there will be selectively how much adenosine can get on the receptor versus caffeine. And if you don't get enough adenosine on the receptor, or regadenosine for that matter, you will not get activation of enough receptors to cause vasodilation. So this brings up the whole idea of coffee. So I go to Starbucks every morning, OK? And I don't get this one, and I don't get that one. I don't even get that one. I get this one, OK? That's 415 milligrams of caffeine in a venti Starbucks coffee, which I have to say I really enjoy first thing in the morning, OK? That's, what, that's why I'm even able to talk as fast as I can today right now, OK? So, so 450 milligrams, but that, if, you, if someone had a venti pike an hour ago, and they're there for an adenosine study, or a regadenosine study for that matter, it's not a good idea. Because all this circulating caffeine is going to bump regadenosine and adenosine off the receptor, and the caffeine's going to go on it instead, and you're not going to get vasodilation, OK? So you know, generally speaking, we recommend 12 hours from the last cup of coffee to getting a pharmacologic stress test. But again, it also depends on the coffee. And I don't go to McDonald's because McDonald's is really pretty bad. 145 milligrams <laughs> doesn't, really doesn't cut it, OK? All right. Now, in terms of giving these agents, as you know, there are different ways. I mean, you can infuse dipritamol over a four-minute period and then inject your radio tracer and image. Uh, not many people use dipritamol anymore. Adenosine. We used to give a six-minute infusion and inject the radio tracer in the mid of the, of the uh, infusion. And now with regadenosine, which is really kind of nice, we give the re regadenosine as a bolus. We give a flush. We give the radio tracer, all done within a minute, and finito. No pumps, no mess, no nothing, not weight-based. 
Uh, so it's really kind of a nice way to, uh, to uh, do pharmacologic vasodilator stress. With regadenosin, you can see what happens. This is looking at regadenosin in terms of the uptake is immediate in terms of flow, and then it gradually comes down. If you give aminophilin, which also competes with the xanthine, it competes for the, uh, for the A2A receptor, you can block the side effects of regadenosin or adenosin or dipritamol or any of those agents with aminophilin. It's best if you're going to give aminophilin to wait at least several minutes after you give the radio tracer so that you have total uptake of the radio tracer in the heart muscle and it's cleared from the blood pool before you give aminophilin, okay, before you reverse the effects. Yeah, I mean, if you have to under emergency circumstances, of course, but it would be best never to give aminophilin until you have, are at least several minutes out and you've cleared the radio tracer from the blood pool. The nice thing, and incidentally, regadenosin gives similar hyperemic effects as exercise, so it increases flow about two and a half to threefold, which is kind of typically what you do when you exercise. There have been two studies that looked at compared regadenosin to adenoscan in the same patients. Uh, these are the advanced studies, and both showed very good comparability between adenosin and regadenosin, and we have actually done a, a quantitative analysis with regadenosin in all of these uh, 1,000 patients in the advanced study showing that the perfusion abnormalities we induce are virtually identical with adenosin as compared to regadenosin. So these are polar maps. This patient has a 40% perfusion abnormality using quantitative spec techniques. The green is the ischemic area, black is scar, and you can see virtually identical results between adenosin and regadenosin. So from this uh, point of view, regadenosin uh, should give similar diagnostic and prognostic information as attained with adenosin, and we already know that adenosin gives similar diagnostic information as compared to maximal exercise stress. All right, one of the nice things about regadenosin is it can be used safely in people with COPD. Okay, this is important because patients with COPD and asthma, generally speaking, it's a contraindication to use other pharmacologic vasodilators because you can induce wheezing, okay? Because remember, you can activate the A3 receptor and induce bronchospasm. With regadenosin, since it's an A2A specific agent, it does not activate the A3 receptor to the same degree as the other agents do, and therefore, it's been shown to be safe. In fact, safe compared to placebo. How better can you get than that, okay? Placebo should have no side effects. All right. So in choosing the proper stress, exercise is always preferred, as I said, especially in those who, uh, who uh, have left bundle branch, except for in those who have left bundle branch block who cannot, or who cannot perform adequate exercise. Pharmacologic vasodilators are recommended next in all others, except that they have a specific contraindication. And um, dobutamine, we hardly ever, never, ever, never give, ever. Uh, anymore because we don't need to because it was usually used mostly in people who had uh, reactive airway disease and now we have regadenosin. So uh, that's the story that stress in terms of pharmacologic agents. Now here we are with images. Okay, so this is a patient who has a stress myocardial perfusion scan. He's got a defect in the septum here which, which on the stress images which gets better on the rest images. So we can look at all of this we can look at wall motion using gated spec in terms of the ejection fraction, and we can also quantify defects. So this patient obviously here has somewhere around a 20% ischemic defect as shown on the polar maps. So from this point of view, being able to put everything together in terms of um, looking at the images, we're diagnosing coronary disease, and we're identifying the presence and extent of ischemia, which clearly has prognostic implications. Now, in terms of CAD diagnosis, as I already said, across the board, whether you look at exercise, vasodilator stress, or dobutamine, you have fairly good sensitivity of almost 90%. Specificity in the old days was relatively low. Specificity now is really greater than 90% if you use attenuation correction and gating to help guide you in terms of what's a false positive uh, or an artifact. So we actually have good results with uh, SPECT imaging. This has also been shown comparing SPECT to PET. So this is PET imaging with 90% sensitivity and 80-something percent specificity, very similar to SPECT imaging as shown in pooled analysis. And what's important from a prognostic point of view is that nuclear is truly a gatekeeper to the cath lab. 
So in patients that have a normal myocardial perfusion scan, and there's lots of data to show this, the death and MI rate is around 0.6% per year. Okay, so if someone has a normal myocardial perfusion scan, it's very, very low risk individual. Conversely, if they have an abnormal myocardial perfusion scan, they have a tenfold difference in event rates. So clearly the normalcy or abnormalcy predicts outcome based on the perfusion abnormality. Is there a perfusion abnormality present or is there a perfusion abnormality not present? Furthermore, as I said, it doesn't only depend on whether you have a defect, but the size of the defect. Size does matter, okay? So if you, look at, if you look here, this is looking at total defect size in the heart, anywhere from zero, normal, up to 80% of the myocardium. This is looking at ischemic defect size in the myocardium. This is data from our own INSPIRE study, which was a post-MI trial, but it shows you that somewhere around at 20%, you have a low risk study, less than a 20% defect or less than 10% ischemia. But once the defect size gets above 20% or 10% ischemia, look how rapidly, how exponentially the risk increases, okay? So as things get larger and larger, risk goes up, 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 and up, okay? And so it's very important to recognize this. So someone with a 20% perfusion defect and 10% ischemia is very different than someone with a 50% perfusion defect and 40% ischemia. The second patient is much higher risk, okay? And you can actually recommend, and we do in our reports, what the risk of the patient is based on their size of the defect. We also know that ejection fraction has a very important role. So in people that have a normal myocardial perfusion scan and a relatively pre preserved ejection fraction, they all do well. But look what happens in people with mild to moderate defects or severe defects. As the, if in patients who have a depressed uh, ejection fraction, risk goes up dramatically. So the combination of knowing the perfusion results plus the gated spec results in terms of what the ejection fraction is is extremely important in terms of stratifying low and high risk individuals. And we have both of that, both of those information available when we do gated myocardial perfusion imaging. Okay? All right. There's also a lot of uh, interest in where these different techniques fit in the ED setting. Uh, this is, happens to be CT data showing that if you have a normal CT, you have a very low risk for having a subsequent event. But that's also true if you have a normal myocardial perfusion scan. The negative predictive accuracy is almost 100%. So in people who are low to intermediate risk who come in with acute chest pain and we do a nuclear study or a CT study on them, uh, in those patients who don't have contraindications to either of those techniques, they have a very, very low risk of having an event if they're normal. These are some data we published uh, three years ago in uh, the Journal of Nuclear Cardiology, looking at a large series of patients who actually had coronary disease. About 10% about of them had known disease. And what you can see here is that if you had a normal myocardial perfusion scan, basically none of those patients had events over a two-year period. Whereas if you had an abnormal myocardial perfusion scan, you can see how high the event rate was. And what's also important to recognize here is that in the normal group, only 3% went for invasive angiography. And of those, less than 1% got revascularized. So it shows you how, by, if you have a normal study, those patients are highly, highly unlikely to have high-grade lesions that will require revascularization. Conversely, those with abnormal studies frequently will have abnormalities. And in fact, in this study, of those that were abnormal, 38% of those patients, almost, almost, almost a third to, to 50%, end, went up and had a revascularization procedure. So the, the non-invasive testing can help guide you in terms of who needs to go to the cath lab and who does not, and who is likely to have a revascularization uh, to improve outcome. Okay, the other thing I'm going to say uh, in terms of myocardial perfusion imaging uh, is that this is the reason why we do it as an initial test. It identifies patients unlikely to benefit from interventional techniques. Those would be low-risk patients with a normal or relatively normal study, small defects, or those who are higher risk but have no ischemia. If you don't have ischemia, there's no reason to revascularize somebody, okay? Conversely, we do identify high-risk patients with ischemia who require aggressive anti-ischemic medical and interventional therapies. So a nice way of dichotomizing groups. This is an example 
of where you can use uh, serial imaging to help guide you in terms of outcomes. This is a patient of mine who had a 26% perfusion defect. You can see the defect here. This is the stress study and the rest study. This patient on, on angiography had diffuse disease and a very large septal perforator. After he went to the cath lab because of the defect size, we obviously sent him to the cath lab. This was not amenable to revascularization. We treated this patient with nitrates, beta blockers, and uh, calcium channel blockers, and brought him back several months later. And look at the scan now. Totally normal. So we can actually track risk and track changes based on serial imaging. And that's, because that's a very important aspect of what we do. So in conclusion with this part of the talk, uh, when you think about myocardial uh, perfusion imaging, the extent of the defect makes, makes in, is important. How much is the size of the defect? How much jeopardized myocardium, ischemic myocardium is present? It also depends on uh, the type of patient you're looking at, whether they have stable coronary disease or unstable symptoms or a status post myocardial infarction. And of course, the ejection fraction becomes a very important determinant of risk as well. So by putting the clinical scenario together and by putting together the uh, perfusion abnormalities and the gating in terms of the ejection fraction, we can very nicely assess risk and guide therapeutic decision making. So that's myocardial perfusion imaging. Now I'm going to switch, uh, I'm going to switch a little bit here. We're going to talk about CT because, frankly, I, I love both techniques. You know, I run the lab that basically does both of these every day of the week. And CT can actually give you very, very nice images. This is just a 3D rendered uh, volume picture. You can see all the coronary arteries really nicely. But it has more than high diagnostic accuracy, and it really identifies one of the strengths of CT is identifies all levels of coronary atherosclerosis. Before I start talking about CT angiography, I'm going to just mention calcium scoring. Is, how many of you know about calcium scoring? Anybody? OK. Well, calcium scoring is really, really important because we recommend that in asymptomatic patients, men over 40, women over 50, who have risk factors, at least one fifth risk factor for coronary artery disease. Because I can tell you that looking out, of course, you're all too young here, but if I looked out on an audience of people, I could never identify, based on their risk factors alone, who would have coronary disease and who wouldn't. You just can't do it. You need a test. So we do calcium scoring. Calcium scoring is nice because, first of all, it's rapid, 10-second acquisition. No patient preparation, no IVs. You just lie down on the table, hold your breath for 10 seconds, and you're done. No contrast, right? Uh, it's performed on standard CT cameras, low radiation, one to two millisieverts of radiation, very low. You get about five millisieverts walking around the planet each year. So very low radiation, easily interpretable and can also identify non-coronary causes of uh, chest pain and acute chest pain. So this is a patient who actually came in, asymptomatic individual, and we look at the calcium in the coronary arteries. So we look at the different, all the circled areas are calci calcifications. And this patient had a calcium score of 740, which is severe, OK? If you look at the data on calcium scoring, and this is in now 44,000 patients, and this is actually only back, this is an old publication, and there's now even more data. If you have a normal calcium score of zero, you basically don't have events. I mean, you're, you're, it's almost like the best thing you could ever have. You have a 99.8% chance of being alive and well on a year-to-year -year basis. However, the converse, so the value of calcium scores of zero, and the other thing is about, about calcium scores of zero, it has a warranty period of about four to five years. So if you have a calcium score of zero today, we wouldn't recommend getting another one for five years to recheck, because about 20% of people with a calcium score of zero will convert to a calcium score of non-zero at year five, OK? What's good about this is that if you have a calcium score of zero and you're asymptomatic and doing well, it precludes having to do a lot of other things. In fact, I wouldn't even put a patient on, uh, with, a, with a high cholesterol on statins if they, had a, if they had a calcium score of zero, because they've already proven to me that they're not laying down plaque, OK? Conversely, if you have a calcium score above zero, the higher the calcium score, the worse you do, OK? 
So this is data from the Mesa investigators, which showed that irrespective, irrespective of ethnicity, okay, black, white, Hispanic, didn't matter. If you were abnormal, if you had an abnormal calcium score, and the higher the calcium score it was, the worse you did, okay? This has important implications because remember, these are asymptomatic people, okay? So there is a paradigm for this. There's the Jupiter study. Jupiter looked at something like 20,000 people, okay, and followed them for several years. These were asymptomatic people with mildly elevated cholesterols. The only thing they had was they had a high CRP, okay? And what Jupiter showed that by treating people with a statin, ruvastatin in this case, there was a 30 to 40% reduction in event rates. Pretty amazing in an asymptomatic population who's just walking around the planet and doing fine, okay? Now, our whole thing based on MESA data is that you can substitute CRP for a calcium score. So our own recommendations and what's becoming out now, is if, you have, if you had any calcium whatsoever, you have coronary disease, period, plain and simple. And if you have coronary disease, you need to have an LDL between 50 to 60 milligrams per deciliter. Okay, to prevent further progression and hopefully get regression of plaque. So calcium scoring is a very powerful tool, not only for identifying people at risk, but also then aggressively treating those patients to try to prevent further events down the line. Okay, that's calcium scoring. The next part of the talk, I'm gonna talk about contrast studies, okay? So what do we know about CT angiography compared to invasive coronary angiography? First of all, we know that in terms of sensitivity, it's highly sensitive. The negative predictive value when you compare CTA to invasive angiography is very high, it's 100%. And so CT actually does very well compared to invasive coronary angiography. Sometimes CTA can overestimate lesion severity, but if you're normal by CTA, it would be highly, 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 highly unlikely that you'd be abnormal by a calf. And that's why the very high negative predictive value. It's also been shown like nuclear, that CT can identify risk. So there are many studies that have been published over the years showing that you can identify risk based on the extent and presence and extent of uh, coronary artery disease based on CT angiography. And in fact, this patient, by this, uh, the particular study by Jim Min, in 24,000 patients who were followed for up to three years, shows that, again, if you have a normal CTA, you have a very low event rate. But as you go from non-obstructed disease to single vessel disease greater than 50%, to double vessel, to triple vessel disease, see how event rates increase, okay? So based on, so if you're absolutely normal, you do well. But if you're abnormal, then depending on the extent of abnormality in your, in your coronary angiogram, it will determine how you do. So mortality significantly increases based on the presence and extent of atherosclerotic disease. Now CT is a great technique, but it can have some problems in terms of technical issues. First of all, if patients have atrial fibrillation or bigeminy, that's a problem. If they have severe asthma and can't get beta blockers, they re reduce their heart rate, that's a problem. If they have renal insufficiency, that's a problem because you can't give contrast. They could have allergies to contrast. They may be morbidly obese, which limits the ability to, to really get good images. Yeah, they have, may have poor IV access, which limits flow of contrast, which can be a problem. And patients who do CTs have to be absolutely motionless. You can get around all other artifacts in CT by some technical things, but if people move during the scan, it's impossible. It's worthless. So you've got to have really get people to do the right things. This is how these CT scans are done. This is a 64 detector. You can see the patient moves through the gantry, and the, and the detector moves with it. Now we have wide angle detectors, which actually within one rotation, you can, you can get the whole patient. Just one spin of the camera. That's, those are those 320 detector arrays. So when we think about CT, every time the camera makes a pass, it gets a piece of data. So with 64 detectors, you need several heartbeats to get a full image. With 320 detectors, you get it all in one. And so think of that as a, as a collage. I mean, here you have the city of Houston. Would you rather look at the city of Houston like this, or would you rather look at it like that? Okay, so you get it all at once, okay? All right, so 
With CT, we can get extremely high quality images, even in one heartbeat, with very low radiation exposure, if you have the most up-to-date, latest and greatest equipment, and you can see that here. The other thing that's important about CT is temporal resolution, because think of it as a shutter on a camera. I mean, if you, have a, if you take a picture of this, of, this, uh, of this apple falling, if you're imaging at 1 15th of a second, you get a lot of blurring. But if you can get, a, get this apple at 1 200th of a second, you freeze frame it, right? So the faster the gantry, OK, the faster you can, you can get images. Because remember, the heart is always moving. The coronaries are always moving. So you have to be able to stop the, the, the images. So nowadays, this is standard 64 slice. This is the scanner we now OK, so rapid. I mean, temporal resolution of 60 milliseconds, OK? So you can really freeze frame the heart. And it's also fast. If you look at the gantry speed on the standard one versus the, the new ones, they go right through, OK? You're done. Two seconds of acquisition, and you're finito. This allows us to get to image very small areas of the R to R interval and allows us to very nicely see images with very nice clarity, even stents, as you can see here. Okay, motionless images. And here's another example. Beautiful case, very low millisievert exposure. Okay? CT can be used for many things. A lot of it is in the detection of coronary disease, but a lot of it is in other things. Determining graft patency, evaluating stents, detecting coronary anomalies, assessing complex cardiac structural diseases, pericardial anatomy, all of this. Let's just look at some examples. Here's an example of a 34-year-old uh, woman who came with chest pain. She had an anterolateral MI. This is the CT image. This is the, this is the invasive coronary angiogram image, showing exactly the stenosis where it should be. This is a patient who had bypass grafts. You see bypass grafts great with CT. And in fact, a lot of times, the patient comes down from the cath lab, and I'm saying, why are you bringing the patient down? He just had a cath. We can't find the grafts. OK, well, I say, we can find them. So we do CTs on them to find the graphs. This is a graph that actually is patent. And you can see there's a stent in the graph as well. Okay? And you'll notice there's also disease distally, which is also picked up on the invasive coronary angiogram. Okay? So you have disease here, 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 and here. Identical pictures. We can look for coronary anomalies. This is a patient who had, who had the left main coming off the right cusp, which is a very serious problem. And uh, you can see that, and we can get 3D rendered images of those. So coronary anomalies are very nicely picked up by CT. Uh, this is, we are commonly use these things in patients who have equivocal stress tests, because you know, we're not sure, is it ischemia, is it not? This is a patient who got imaged, minimal placking in the, in the right, minimal placking in the LED, and in the ramus. So this patient had an equivocal MPI, stress myocardial perfusion scan, but no significant obstructive disease. Of note, he did have something else. And this is a VSD, a membranous VSD, that was identified by CT. And you can see the flow from the left side of the heart to the right side. This is a patient who had um, a recent myocardial infarction. You can see this contrast over here, over here, over here, and over here. And this patient actually had a pseudoaneurysm. He blew out the wall of his heart. And in fact, we can look at that dynamically as well. And so here's an example of a patient. If I can get, maybe I'll get this to work. You can see this guy had a pseudoaneurysm. This is the left ventricle. This is all contrast within the pericardium. Okay, so very nice ways to look at things. This is a patient who had an apical thrombus after a heart attack. Very nice to be able to pick up those things on CTs. Okay, this is a patient who had a patient of mine actually had a stent in the right coronary artery, and came in with chest pain, and we did a CT on her, and we saw all of this, and the stent was patent, everything looked good. But she also had a left atrial myxoma. She had a mass in her, left, in, her, in her left atrium. So she went for surgery for this and did fine. But we can pick up masses. And we can pick up not only things like myxomas, which are incredibly uh, uh, common, but also things like this. This is a sarcoma involving the, uh, the heart. Okay? And we can see at these kind of tumors how they affect the heart. So this is a lymphoma that's actually compressing the right coronary artery. So we can see this with exquisite detail, all of these different things with CT. We can also look at valves. This is a patient with a bicuspid valve. Instead of three leaflets, there's two leaflets. So this is what a normal valve looks like, and this is what a bicuspid, only two leaflets versus three. 
We can also look at valvular abnormalities like aortic insufficiency. This is a patient in diastole. You can see the hole here in the valve. This is a normal valve where there's no hole, okay? And we're able to actually quantify the amount of leakage uh, looking at CT in diastole. So we can look at aortic valve disease, native aortic valve disease. We can also look at aneurysms. This is a patient who had a large aneurysm of the ascending aorta. The patient also had severe AI, and we're able to quantify that by CT. Okay, so com combining many different things to look at different procedures. Okay, this is a patient who had a who had a uh, who had a mitral valve replacement. We can look at valvular uh, prostheses, whether they be bioprosthetic or mechanical, very nicely. This is diastole. This is systole. This is a patient who had actually dehiscence of his valve. He had a, he had endocarditis, and uh, you can see the valves in motion. So this is the valve in systole and diastole, and this is the hole. This is actually a leak from the, a, from the sinus into the left ventricle. The guy had severe aortic insufficiency, but a normally functioning valve, okay? So you're able to see those kind of things very nicely on CT. This is also a patient who had, a, had an abnormality with his valve, and you can see that the, one of the valve leaflets is frozen. It's frozen, it's not moving, okay? And uh, this patient also had other problems he had actually endocarditis, and uh, we commonly do CT scans in patients with endocarditis. And here you can see that there's actually a, a, a rupture. So here's a pseudoaneurysm in the aorta with a fistula going down into the left ventricle. So this guy had massive aortic insufficiency due to a fistulous tract from the aorta into the left ventricle. And this allows the surgeons the ability to identify what they need to do uh, before they go in and do it. How many people know about LVADs, left ventricular assist devices? Okay, well we can also image those because sometimes those patients have problems too. They develop clots. This is a patient who has a, who has a clot in the, in, the, in the sinus here and uh, through an embolus, okay? And this, he also had a little bit of anastomosis uh, uh, constriction there as well, as well as this thrombus. This is a patient who actually had more serious problems this patient had a completely thrombosed uh, outflow cannula and a completely thrombosed inflow cannula. And, if you, and this patient went for surgery, and you can see the clot throughout the device. Okay, so this is something you can pick up on CT and, uh, and, and be able to identify. We can, as I said, we can look at valves. This is a guy with actually normal valvular function. This patient had double valves. He had an aortic valve here, which you see functioning nicely, and he also had a mitral valve replacement, and you can see this functioning nightly. This is a mitral valve, okay? So we can look at that at CT, and actually the reason why this patient had this CT was because of symptoms of pericardial constriction. You can see this severe calcification of the pericardium, and on top of that, he also had a clot in his left atrial appendage. So he had multiple different problems, and we commonly look for these things when people have EP procedures in terms of thrombus before they have uh, uh, atrial fibrillation ablation procedures. So there is that. Um, we can also look at, uh, at other devices. For instance, this is a patient who had what we call a watchman device, and you can see the location of these things. Uh, these are placed to prevent clots from uh, going from the left atrial appendage into the systemic circulation. Uh, we can also look at complications of AFib ablations. This is a patient who actually had severe pulmonic vein stenosis and had severe shortness of breath and had to have ac actually have angioplasty of all these pulmonary veins because one of the complications of radiofrequency ablation is to get stenosis of the pulmonary veins. Okay? And uh, we can also look at other things. This is an atrial septal aneurysm. This is a patient with actually an atrial septal defect, a secundum defect. Uh, and this is a patient who had a large pericardial effusion uh, where we actually just got a non-contrast study on him. And he had actually cardiac, almost pre-cardiac tamponade. You can see this effusion, which you can see very nicely on CT. So in conclusion, and I'm right at 1150, I can't believe it. Uh, there are many ways in which we can use CT2. Okay, so we can assess coronary disease and anatomy, coronary anatomy and cardiac function, cardiac valves, native and prosthetic, tumors, pericardial disease, pulmonary veins, thrombus, thoracic aorta and its branches in terms of looking at aneurysms and dissections, 
And so both nuclear cardiology and CT are not only exclusive, but they're also complementary in many regards. And I hope I gave you at least some flavor, some flavor for how we utilize these techniques in clinical practice. Thank you very much.